Well, hello, and thanks for joining in today's uh, DFR Solutions rep webinar on improved efficiency and reliability for data center servers using immersion cooling technology. I'm Cheryl Polkoff, um, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. And uh, before we get started, just did want to remind you um, I will be looking for questions, comments, input by the chat and question boxes. So please do fill out those as we're going along. We'll have the opportunity to address some questions and plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. Um, and any of your own personal experiences or anecdotes will be great as well. Everyone who does attend today uh, will get a follow-up link with a um, copy of the slide and access to the recording of the webinar um, for sharing and later review as well. But again, uh, thank you for joining me here today. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you about some of the updates, um, challenges, and opportunities in immersion cooling technology. Um, it's been a, a really interesting segment of the field for me to look at. Um, I've been kind of following it closely for about, I don't know, three years or so now in kind of a, an interesting way in. Um, I'm based in Austin, Texas, and we had not one but two startups um, who came into the immersion cooling technology space and the immersion oil side, and that's Midas Green Tech and Green Revolution Cooling. And so, um, you know, we had seen kind of their uh, initial presentation, and I was familiar with the technology. I'd started out my career at IBM years ago, and IBM had been um, using immersion cooling for some of their high-tech chips, and I'll show you some of those examples in today's presentation. Um, I hadn't seen it for years until science seemed to kind of pop back up on the radar again. But what I thought was interesting about the, you know, the, the initial presentations I saw in Austin is that they're focused on um, all about the cost savings and the efficiency side from the data center standpoint. And they didn't really seem to be looking or considering you know, potential um, enhancements or challenges from the reliability side. And I thought this was particularly interesting in that they were, you know, approaching the data center or the server market where reliability is really everything. Um, yes, they are interested in cost savings, but there's also a lot of cost associated with downtime and failures in that market as well, too. And so I thought it was um, kind of a, an interesting way to kind of get involved and potentially see, you know, where this was going to, you know, expand and how it might change. Um, you know, as, as they got a little deeper penetration. And so it's been interesting to watch and see um, what's happened in the, the past couple of years, and um, it's changed quite substantially in that time frame. And so with the time that we have today, I'm just going to give you a, a very brief introduction, um, an overview as to you know, kind of what's going on with immersion cooling technology in the space. A little bit of you know what's in the news and the new competition and some of the the players or companies that are working in this space, um, what they were pitching as the technology benefits. Of course, what we see is some of the challenges to those and where there might be some potential for um, reliability and not just reliability from the data center perspective but reliability of the electronics, the printed circuit boards and components actually within the servers themselves, which is an area that I'm particularly interested in. And then we'll do a recap, wrap up, and again, you know, leave plenty of time for questions and answers and you know, any feedback or comments that you might have. Again, please do use um, the chat box and the question box. I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, take any kind of questions or you see what your experiences have been. And so with that, um, you know, immersion cooling is nothing new. Um, it's been around for, gosh, going on 30 years now. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I started out my career with IBM and was familiar with some of the high-powered chip applications that, was being, that were being used for at the time. And then you know, even the very early supercomputers like the Cray-2 or relying on different types of liquid cooling technologies. And so, you know, a couple of the, the images over here on the right side of the screen are showing you know, some of these um, applications and kind of what they look like in terms of this case, water, heat exchangers and pumps going around the system, and you know, some of the, the chip mounted applications. 
um, you know, that come out of the IBM world. So, you know, from a concept standpoint in technology, um, it isn't new, but it's been kind of limited to kind of the rare air applications, very high in supercomputing, expensive, driving that. And of course, you know, as we'll talk through the context of today's webinar, the interest in the opportunities there, um, and then there's some ways in which to kind of tie in the potential reliability improvement but a lot of work that needs to, to go on in understanding also some of the challenges that these technologies might bring to the industry and that are you know, potentially those barriers to wider adoption. And so you know, just um, a, a quick and dirty recap of you know, why this looks interesting from the thermal side of the equation, um, a few just data points here. So if we look at the thermal conductivity in, in a standard air application versus water versus some of the mineral oil immersion cooling um, materials, you can see how much better um, some of these other materials are at conducting heat away air is. So we're talking orders of magnitude increases in thermal conductivity and we're driving a lot of heat and especially as we continue to shrink our electronics. And so, you know, thermal management required, you know, specific to data centers and how immersion cooling can substantially um, reduce costs in, in keeping things at a reasonable temperature, you know, to cool air with fans and power applications versus, you know, the same type to remove um, a, a watt of waste heat again, order of magnitude, less power required um, in an immersion oil application. And there are others which we'll, we'll talk about um, during today's presentation as well. But so you can see just some fundamental physics thing about keeping electronics cool, saving some money, and being more efficient in a data center. And just a quick reprocess, and then with some of the engineered materials, this concept of a two-phase immersion cooling, where we have this boiling action where the vapor is captured and recirculated, and this um, extra phase change even allows for more or higher rate of heat removal, but that comes at the expense of added complexity and cost. And so you can see, or you will see, that they're being kind of used in, in slightly different applications maybe eventually, or there is a little bit of convergence, but you'll see some of the ways in which they're used differently, um, and then who some of the, the key players are, and some, some of the interesting installations that I've seen published about in the past year or so, um, as I've been watching what's going on in this part of the technology world. So, so this is an example of what the single phase systems look like. So cooling using dielectric oil, um, this is showing an application from Midas Green Tech, one of the two companies based here in Austin, Texas. You can see the servers you know, completely immersed um, in the oil, cables coming out. And um, I'll talk touch on this a little bit more in subsequent slides, but you know, it's some type of engineered fluids and using that boiling action. Um, um, and you can see you know, from their wording, it has some other things that it might bring to the table, but a much more expensive solution. And so you know, these can cost on the order of you know, $70 a gallon. So a little different price point and potentially um, different locations in the short term because of some of the cost differences and complexity differences. But I'll continue to touch on um, more of those as we go through today's presentation. It's here in Austin with the immersion oil technology, kind of what it looks like. And you know, these tanks can dissipate roughly 40 kilowatts of power or more, you know, depending on the application. But you know, they can be very efficient and capable removers of heat. And you know, one of the things just in the past two years, as I mentioned, it was fairly quiet for a very long period of time. And now, um, at least monthly, if not more frequently, there's a new installation, a new report, new you know um, interest in the media on urge cooling and applications or new reports out there, and some of that has been uh, coming from the research front in institutions like CERN in Switzerland, the University of Leeds, 
um, an example I'll show you shortly um, in Tokyo. So they've been doing a lot of work in it. This picture here on the right is showing a liquid a liquid cooling in a rack-based module that's at the CERN facility. And so, you know, it's it helped drive the maturity of the technology, um, some longevity, added some more data to the conversation, and kind of helped give it um, some, some test or some substantiation behind, you know, what some of the people in the data center side were helping drive. And so it seems that we're aware that it's the immersion side, you know, one of the first um, example um, was used first for trading the New York Stock Exchange. And so that was their first installation there, high frequency traffic and trading in um, another industry that cares a lot about high reliability or uptime for their data. And you can imagine they're not very happy um, if their access to information and trading goes down. And so that was a, an interesting early application. And they had one of the first rack-mounted liquid submerged servers out there, too. And they've continued to expand their presence. Um, and um, was um, came out of the, the Tokyo Institute of Technology. So they've got their presence um, in terms of materials, um, the mineral oil being cheaper application at roughly $10 a gallon versus some of the engineer materials that are closer to the $70 a gallon mark. Um, but it, of course, depends on you know, how many. You know, this is a single tank or a use application, is that, you know, how much some of those different um, materials, whether they were considering for your application or not. I'll show you more, too. It's not just a cost differential. The engineer materials have the ability to remove in a little more detail as we progress through the webinar today. Then I mentioned that expansion and watch all the, the different approaches. Um, also, what they're trying to propose is the value. As I mentioned, when I first saw it, and even the bulk of what I see today, and I'll show you a little bit more as we proceed through, is that they were very much focused on um, cost savings. So we can save you this energy, we can save you this footprint, we can save you the size, power, um, with very little focus on reliability, except outside the reliability of the installation. So no real focus on the reliability of the electronics or potential impacts to the reliability shift a little. And so I'll show you a couple of examples um, where people are starting to think about that, propose that, and put it out there. Um, because as I mentioned, this is an, a part of the industry that does, does care about cost, but is also very much reliability focus as well, longer term installations, a need for uptime, um, and very low tolerance for electronic failures in there. So we'll talk about you know, some of the, the different solutions that each of these companies offer, where they're at today, and some of the kind of interesting work that they've got going on. And so here he is, I see a test. And um, again, their their pitch, the chillers, you know, all the overhead. They don't spend too much time talking about um, you know reliability outside that. And they are of course using the 3M um, Novak material, non-conductive, inert, great convection, and also that fire protection um, capability that's built within the unit. And it may be a little hard to see in this image, but this is the cabinetry. Um, around their solution. You can see a little bit on the inside of it in there. So they're one of the companies that's offering um, a platform that uses that two-phase uh, in their tubing and you know, on top of the chip rather than in submerged in it. Um, and then you know, you've got this kind of action over here showing the, the boiling behavior, having the ability to really get you some thermal reduction, um, even in a data center that's like in Phoenix, the desert, and the ambient temperature is greater than 120. Um, that phase change really allows you to pull in earlier. This is one of those two companies that's based in, they have in a data center, all their tank-based systems here, and a little bit about their um, jet fluid submersion rack the oil inlets and outlets and how it's kind of flowing in and around through the system to accomplish the cooling um, that they're providing. And so they've been really interesting to watch. 
um, it actually got some installations out of systems out into the field, set up mobile operations and data centers very quickly, um, and you know, be able to keep them at temperatures and protected environments. Um, in some of the places they go to. And so right now they have installations in six countries across three continents um, with the U.S. military and elsewhere where they've been able to show that you know, these do work in action in places that before you know, may never have been suitable to be able to, to set up an operation like this. So another neat application of the liquid cooling technology you know, enabling um, enabling a um, different take on liquid cooling gauge. If you can see in the image over here, um, you basically have what looks like a heat sink replacement. So rather than your heat sink, um, you've got their little coolers that are mounted on and the tubes that are coming in and out with the liquid being circulating around them to get heat in and out of the system. And so you can either retrofit an existing um, server or um, computer with those types of replaced heat sinks. It's at the coolers. Another application where there's no liquid coming into direct contact with the electronics, um, you know, unlike the immersion oil or some of the immersion engineered liquid cooling to keep things cool and kind of you know, companies beginning to engage more in the data center side. Um, you know, the original pitch for the vast majority and still the, the pitch that they're making is kind of the business side to the data center um, finance people. We can reduce your capital. We can reduce your real estate. We can reduce your operating expenses over conventional. So if you're retrofitting um, a current data center or considering building a new one, we can save you a lot of money overhead and time. Um, they're also pitching the concept of what I showed you, that um, being able to move them, set them up in mobile or temporary locations without all the need um, for the extra overhead and infrastructure. Um, very little changes required to the things that are already in place for a standard data center. Um, lots on the, the um, electricity and the green front. And what we've been trying to get a little more focus on is not just the installers to keep them up and running. And just a kind of application, um, you know, more than half the cost is the expense of the, the gear, the hardware, the servers, the networking equipment. But you know, 25 to 40 percent is the expenses associated with keeping things cool, with powering them, so the total expense um, that you could potentially impact by altering you know, the way and method of keeping the electronics cool enough to function well over time. And this is another slicer way of looking at it. You know, if you're the power that the data center the facility uses versus what's really required for the business, what they call the IT load, what really is the fundamental, what you need to run the data servers and um, everything else kind of overhead. So the things that aren't contributing to the IT load are places that you could use or potentially reduce cost, be more efficient, and save the business money. So that's the, kind of the industry metric, and you'll see that a lot in the kind of business side. Is um, this is showing the concept? So you know, basically a third of the size, um, and then half the power consumption to do the exact same work of the 10,000 to run those 10,000 servers. So money and savings in utility bills, and less real estate or size of the facility that you would have to build in order to um, meet your data requirements or needs called power consumption. In this case, 5 megawatts still use much less size or still have a much smaller mix. Look really good from the people who are running a data center in terms of you know, kind of all the, the overhead or structure that's required to support a given number of servers um, for the data that you need. And then sector today, um, what you'll find today is that there's almost no one who are designing equipment to go directly into immersion cooling technology. So what the vast majority of installations are doing are taking um, off-the-shelf servers, um, equipment, servers, um, networking gear, and they are prepping them so that they can be put into oil or um, engineered solutions. And so what you see um, is that you have to remove the fans, 
Um, if there's any thermal grease or paste, those kind of interface materials, they have to be stripped off because they contaminate the solution. Um, for the disc arrays or drive, they either need to be sealed, coated, potted, or using um, some form of the solid state drives or some of the new um, hermetic ones in there. To do all those modifications, you know, take off some of the brackets and hard into the tank today. And as I mentioned, um, unknowns regarding what it means for the electronics. And so we're starting to see a little bit of the data, a little bit of that change as more information comes out. So um, in the 2012 time frame, Green Revolution Cooling and Intel um, embarked on a year-long study. And um, you know, that went along with potential damage. And that came out to the press mostly in the 2012 awareness. And then we started to see the first people, um, they, they would intentionally begin designing compute, um, boards, um, systems directly to go into that. One of the first um, public ones I saw was from super microcomputer that found into immersion processes rather than have to be retrofitted um, or altered. And of course, that altering voids the warranty for the most part. If they find out several, I'll be showing you is, of course, you know, the, the hard drive situation. And so they've got to be sealed up. If they leak, you know, it causes failure um, or get hermetically sealed ones, helium-filled ones that, you know, another potential option for these units that are going to go directly into immersion-cooled applications. But still another challenge for the industry in terms of adoption. And then a whole host of component-specific. I'll highlight a couple. Opto components are one of them, you know, that would submerging them in various fluids impact their performance. And so this is one of the studies, uh, earlier studies that Midas had done that was looking at um, network time, lost data packets, pings, time to get things in and out. Um, and the, the first work that we had seen published, you know, showed that it was pretty comparable whether it was immersed or not. So it didn't appear, appear to have a significant impact um, for what's been available out there so far. Another area that hasn't you know, detected or that didn't detect any shifts in performance, um, but still an area of concern for the industry across different frequency ranges is a potential challenge. And of course, a lot of things on degradation of materials, impact on interconnections, um, where it could, and also impact on components where it could compromise packaging or get inside things um, where no one's really evaluated the impact of having oil or a coolant inside them. Another round, you know, using something like this mineral oil as a flammable, as a health hazard, you know, how would city codes and, and um, safety codes treat it? Um, that has a proven to be much of a challenge so far. You know, in, in terms of the mineral oil, it's fairly benign. You know, it's not too much different from baby oil at the supermarket kind of application. Um, in terms of flammability, it ranks um, among the lowest, one out of four on the scale. And so we haven't seen any requirement for fire suppression systems beyond you know, what data centers just do as normal business protection schemes anyway. Um, you know, standard containment measures, you know, are capable of capturing in larger installations, spill pans, berms, bunkers, situation. So we haven't seen that. Um, because, however, that we did hear from the people who are making the equipment that wasn't necessarily designed to go into immersion cooling is on the repair or rework end. Okay, so what happens? And so, you know, they are hot swappable. Um, all the, the installations out there. You can you know, pull a unit out where everything's functioning, put another one back in, and you know, they'll lift the server out and simply let the majority of the oil just drain right off um, fairly easily. Um, however, if you did need to send a board out to a repair facility or back to someone for potential warranty work, um, the expectation is that some type of cleaning really needs to be done to make sure the oil isn't present. It doesn't show back up at a repair depot or they would, one of the things we haven't seen very well addressed at the installation. Um, we're seeing that as a challenge yet, but it's potentially something where they need to set up 
some type of cleaning, whether it's a small type of ultrasonic cleaner or some type of batch cleaner that would be capable of removing um, the oil or the, the fluid from the boards and the components in the area. Um, just um, not uh, realizing it was under a component or forgetting about it when they were doing that conversion, you know, for an off-the-shelf material, um, you know, getting into the oil and it'll make it cloudy. You know, they've been able to filter it out, replace it, and clean up around that, but you know, things to look out for, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later. You know, one of the challenges um, with these is you know, understanding if there is an, an age to the oil, if you will, to the degrade, um, does it accumulate things um, over time as components or plasticizers break down in the oil, what would that mean, would it alter it and understand that thoroughly. And with my going forward, you know, from the, the actual printed circuit board server side, not the facility side. And so that was really my interest in kind of following this technology is, you know, I see so many failures um, due to just, you know, thermal issues due to corrosion, electrochemical migration. Um, and a lot of concerns as we've, you know, gone into the lead-free world with tin whiskers. I thought, you know, there's some potential for this to mitigate some of those for people who are able to consider immersion cooling as an option. So um, these are a couple um, in there, you know, so tin whiskers, um, corrosion, contamination reduction, stability, um, those types of things. So I'm going to go back briefly here. There was um, one. I don't think I wanted to make sure I highlighted something. Um, things here. Um, what I liked about the liquid cool, some of the updated, um, you know, again, I mentioned them earlier as the, the one being used in the stock um, operations, but their latest iteration of their website, um, they were one of the ones that had the most focus on enhancing reliability at the board level about this reduction in solder joint failures because of thermal cycling this overall um, lower operating temperature or level failures and reliability, um, which I thought was, you know, again, my disease. Um, one of them is tin whiskers, and you for these, especially in um, places like data centers where you have um, longer life requirements, um, where you have um, electronics that are you know, sitting still in cabinet situations where we've seen tin whiskers and zinc whiskers form before, um, as, as, a, as a potential way where emerging cooling stuff can mitigate against that. And some of the ways in which these whiskers cause failure, you know, obviously there's the direct short and arcing, um, you know, lead to lead, you know, potential performance issues. So electromagnetic radiation, noise at higher frequency, um, if they break off, they might not short directly, but they land on other things which could short. You know, these are all things that could be mitigated um, or potentially eliminated by being immersed in a dielectric fluid um, like oil or these engineered solutions. You know, the arcing, um, the ability to um, break off things before they short by the action of the, the oil or the fluid moving around, rotating, and of course the ability to stop. And so, you know, potentially a way to add another failures due to contamination and cleanliness in the industry, you know, kind of supply chain for us. And, you know, not only does it cause, you know, some catastrophic failures, but it can also cause those crazy kind of intermittent ones as well. So this image is an example of um, some little dendrites, these little feathery dendrites that grow. There's a video that goes well in this particular um, design that it was used for, but it causes this kind of um, very difficult to replicate behavior, no trouble found, no fault found. Um, it'll either eventually stop working entirely or work great because it finally runs out of fuel and didn't cause a catastrophe you know, before it you know, kind of sealed itself. And one of the reasons as we progressed in the industry, we've shrunk components and sizes so our pitches are smaller, so the space between conductors is shorter, it's easier to grow things and cause failures. We're using a lot of new um, bottom termination and leadless packages like QFNs and land grid arrays. 
you've got power and ground and close um, all of our products they've become more mobile in uh, humidity you know salt water you know all different types of locations and of course the simple conversion to lead free is me as and, and it, while we're also sh um, shrinking things it's been more aggressive fluxes um, increases in temperatures and all those things further aggravate or um, increase our likelihood that we'll have contamination failures. And you know, those are things that can all be mitigated or potentially eliminated by some of these different immersion cooling technologies. And that depends on which technology and you know, which trigger you have, but they're all um, you know, potentially impactable by that. And so again, an area of interest um, for those of us watching there. And when we talk about you know, where does some of our contamination come from, well, you know, we all have always had and continue to have just the fabrication processes themselves, but we're always worried about the storage and the in-use environment. We, we've got a much greater degree of control over our production processes, how our customers and the end users, um, how and what they do with them, um, sometimes we get some big surprises out there in the world, and so that's again a place where the immersion cooling um, you know, has the opportunity to, to kind of address some of those. And so you know, we talked about the ability in the use environment for dirt, dust, debris, moisture, um, installations that are close to oceans, seawater, um, industrial pollutants, air pollution. You know, these immersion processes really you know, can keep, uh, you know, obviously we've lost fans, and fans are commonly places where debris gets clogged up in them. Um, they need routine maintenance and care over time. If they don't, they eventually stop working, and your electronics overheat. You, know, you just don't face those challenges environment. And then um, around in the industry for a while now, this uh, creep corrosion plated boards um, that went out into their use environment and were exposed to um, high ambient levels of sulfur. And when that happened, the immersion silver and the sulfur reacted um, and caused failures in the border of um, field incidences here. Um, and you know, originally, it was these kinds of um, more industrial applications, right, where we had expected higher amounts of sulfur. So if no surprise there, um, but obviously those types of places would be, you know, fixed installations where immersion cooling could prevent that kind of um, exposure of the sulfur coming into contact with immersion silver or exposed copper, for that matter. So this is a problem that none of us could ignore, regardless of locality. The United States destroyed a lot of buildings. You know, the U.S. Um, went in to kind of reconstruct everything rapidly. We couldn't support or provide enough drywall, and so we began importing it from overseas. And um, a lot of it came from China, and it turned out that Chinese drywall had high levels of sulfur. That sulfur outgassed, and not only did people lose their electronics, jewelry, um, copper pipes, and wiring, and it drove a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit, um, some of which still haven't been settled yet. Um, but it just shows that you know you never really know exactly what your use environment is going to have and where potential environmental contaminants and exposure is going to come from in your electronics. And these are places where these immersion cooling options, you know, the ones that are truly submerged, you know, kind of prevent that contact from happening in the first place. One of the things that we have been able to do and look at in these immersion cooling applications versus immersion cooling submersion um, and look at the impact in hot spots you know, with some of our thermal equipment, with thermocouples, with thermal guns, to see how the performance changes, to look for uniformity, look for hot spots um, and things like those. And that's one of the really nice things about the immersion oil is that not only overall reduction in temperature, but um, the uniform behavior across the board. And so just in general for electronics, lower temperatures are better and stability is better you know, than cycling situations. And so um, you know, that um, has some of the most data um, for it in these 
installations. This is the potential advantages there. And then I did want to show a couple things. I mentioned you know, didn't did a, a very big press release talking about the fact that you know it worked. And but what I really liked or what I thought was you know, interesting is not only are we addressing technical challenges, but you really do have to get past this kind of um, emotional reaction of you're going to do what to my equipment and it's safe or it's reliable to you know, put your electronics into a fluid of some sort. And so you really do get that kind of visceral kind of emotional reaction when you know, people aren't familiar with it and you're trying to you know, talk to them about you know, potential advantages and it's hard to get past that sometimes. Um, but as you said, Intel found basically that this year-long study, processors, hard drives, you know, nothing um, in the systems that they were evaluating you know, ended up with any damage you know, from their analysis. And so they were going to begin, you know, looking at designing some um, boards and some hardware specifically with immersion oil um, technologies in mind, again, so that companies wouldn't have to kind of alter the hardware um, to go into the tanks or the racks to begin with. And so, you know, that kind of, you know, summarizes kind of the, the state of where, you know, things are today that will end the performance. Um, impact. You know, we think that there's some reliability advantages out there, but that most of the companies um, haven't gotten that aspect of it yet. Um, you know, we've been trying to encourage some of the test ways um, or cause unexpected failure modes that we haven't prepared ourselves for, and knowing that we can you know, potentially get some reductions in these here. But again, you know, the, the work that we've seen right here, the most that's got data around it has been you know, this kind of the easiest one here is you know, the thermal. Um, that's very easy to measure. Um, we haven't seen anything you know, on the tin whisker side and only a little bit on the other side about people potentially thinking about it, but um, not a lot of hard data that's out there. And so again, as I mentioned, um, you'll get a copy of the slides. It's got a number of other people's experiences and you're know, trying to, to get or acquire appendix of the slides um, with some of the information that I collect after we're done today. And of course, our contact information is in here, so if you think of something um, that you'd like to share, ask later, please do contact me via email and I'd be glad to follow up with you there. And so we've got a couple questions over in the chat box now. Let's see. Um, is the mineral oil fire retardant? Um, it, it, it's certainly not flammable. It's not a fire retardant in the way that um, the engineer solutions are. Um, so, for instance, the 3M material is um, used in actual kind of the, the application systems for fire suppression. And so the oil isn't meant to be used in that application at all. And so that's an area where the 3M solution the superior is as a fire retardant because it was specifically designed for that. It's a little bit different um, spin there. We also have what is the effect of mineral oil and coolants on electrolytic caps and optical. Um, I just showed you a little bit about the optical. Um, some of that work is underway. Um, again, only a few um, data points that I have seen. The ones that I've seen haven't shown an impact, but not a lot of data out there. Um, the electrolytic caps um, is definitely you know, of interest, both pro and con, in that um, could it potentially um, alter or compromise the bung or the seal? and allow the, that electrolyte out. Um, but you know, one of the real challenges of electrolytic caps is you know, heat stability over time um, because those do, um, they are performance limiters in applications because the electrolyte um, does boil off, degrade, um, is lost over time. And so you could potentially have impacts both good and bad from the immersion experience good and that it keeps them at a lower temperature and less variation, um, the things that drive the actual wear out or breakdown mechanism 
um, but potentially con and that you know it, it could alter um, the, 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 the very seal that's keeping the electrolyte in. Again, I haven't seen data there yet, but that's on it that was on the list of concern where um, and people have asked, and we had our own concerns as well. We haven't actually tested it, and I haven't seen any data on that. And um, this is, what is the industry using instead of thermal grease? Uh, well, when they go into the immersion cooling, they no longer need those thermal interface materials at all. So when they go into that, you simply remove the thermal grease and you don't replace it with anything um, in the installations that they're doing today. And then do immersed PCB assemblies in oil show signs of outgassing? Um, there are some preliminary indications that there are materials coming off. Um, that was one of the things that um, you know, we were especially interested in. And, and how these companies were going to monitor um, and assess the solutions, um, whether they were engineered materials or oil-based materials over time. All of them do have various types of filtering, um, certainly for particulate matter and for some other types of things. Um, but you know, we were more interested in, in actually the physical composition they break down? Do certain materials accumulate over time? At some point, should you be you know, replacing the material or simply you know, just continuing to add material to it, like we do with solder pots and those types of things for the most part? Would that be sufficient to keep them at low enough levels? Um, I think the, the, the data is still out. The jury's out on that as to what that is. Um, it's something that we're concerned about and that they've uh, the companies that we've seen have made improvements to their filtration and monitoring, um, but um, kind of an incomplete monitoring of what's really um, being captured and do we have the resolution um, to figure that out in you know, kind of that huge bath system. You know, can we get a sample um, you know, that would, would show that with the degree of resolution we need? So that is an area that I, I think still needs to be addressed. Where I haven't seen any good data. In terms of safety risk, um, we haven't seen any safety risk there. In fact, um, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when we do like dielectric breakdown testing and some of the high um, high voltage testing, one of the ways in which we make those tests safer is to do just this: is to immerse the electronics in materials like the 3M materials or oil. That's how we um, make it safer and make it less likely to arc and become hazardous. And the industry has done that for years um, as a way to mitigate that potential. Um, and so you know, it actually you know, makes some things um, less likely to be harmful, you know, immersed in, in these fluids from that standpoint. And then um, let's see. We've got another question here on requirements or systems for filtering. I can show you some schematics on what they're doing, um, but again, most of their filtering um, is on a, a larger scale level, you know, mostly for um, particulates, some of the, the greases and things they've been able to capture. Um, we haven't seen um, you know, anything like terribly advanced for trying to separate out other types of um, things that might be breaking down in the oil. Now, there is work going on, um, and they have made improvements because some of the original systems basically had only gross particulate filters. And it, they certainly made some enhancements or changes there. Um, but I haven't seen anything terribly sophisticated in terms of the, um, the things in the oil side. I'm not as... Um, familiar with what they're doing on the engineered solution side, but um, those systems are a lot more complex, but I don't know how much more complex their filtration is. So that's something that um, I'd have to look up more for. And let's see. Field connectors. Um, in terms of um, Sealing connectors, no one has done that at this point. You know, they've just let the oil run in and around um, the, the standard mating processes. Um, and that hasn't shown to be a problem so far, that you know, if it was mated prior to it, they just 
um, dumped it in and went there. They're not doing anything special to conformally coat or seal off those types of applications um, from the connector standpoint. And then let's see, our failure rate different. Um, that's something between oils and engineered fluids, um, unknown. Um, and some of that, I think, is just the, you know, the volume of installations is still relatively small, and the number of servers involved is still relatively small. It was just at the beginning of this year that I had the opportunity to look at two failures that came out of an immersion oil application. And um, so they were kind of interesting that way to see, because this was an application um, here in Texas, not in Austin, but in elsewhere, where they were taking um, some off-the-shelf motherboards um, and um, you know, immersing them in oil for the temperature stability performance that they needed. And this particular um, motherboard actually came from three different suppliers that had the same functionality. Two of the suppliers, the systems worked great in the oil. One of the suppliers, their system did not. And there were a couple components that we were focusing in on um, as being the differences between there. So we certainly have seen failures, but it's not, um, I said I've got exactly three as my entire body <laughs> to work on. So it's not a great sample size. I haven't seen people publish on it. I haven't seen anything at all in terms of the engineered solutions and failures um, coming out. So it's really an unknown as to um, what the failure rate is as a percentage or even count. Is it better or worse between immersion uh, oil versus engineered fluids um, versus air? Um, and if there are any different or um, failure modes or onset rates in failure modes, which is you know one of the things that we're on the lookout for as well is, you know, are we potentially um, reducing some failures and coming up with some new ones, you know, some kind of degradation by contact with these fluids or oils um, or earlier or later onset because of that interaction. There's not enough data, not enough people talking about it to, to have anything, um, you know, even a kind of a gut feel for what that is at this point. We've got another question here. Um, let's see vibration and shipping impacts. Um, they're not being shipped or, you know, the, the only the kind of the motion at this point here is relative to like trailer applications. And I'm honestly um, not clear on if they've got much data and how much, you know, motion they have. We expect actually um, some mitigation of some of the shock and vibration. Um, but I haven't seen it measured, and I don't know that. Um, I haven't seen any data to support it one way or another. Certainly it is a lot more mass, um, but things are also much less prone to moving abruptly. But that's certainly an area, and again, there's only the kind of the six installations that I'm aware of that Green Revolution cooling has done that are kind of in a more mobile environment that I think would be the best kind of use case to understand something something like that at this point. So another great question, but again, um, not a lot in the way of data. And so that's one of the things I'm hoping that for those of you who are online or interest, if you have some things you've seen or can share, you know, we'll continue to kind of collect it, aggregate it, and, and see if we can help come up with the, kind of the reliability um, information that at least is out there and available in one place, because that is, is really the challenge for those of us who focus on reliability. You know, it's potentially got a, a lot of good adders, but it's got very little in the way of um, substantiated data to help us back that up. And so with that, that looks like the bulk of the questions that I can um, kind of answer quickly or relatively easily for you here. Um, again, please do submit them um, after the fact uh, as well, too, by email. And we'll continue to kind of collate them and put them together. Um, do contact me. Any stories, I'd love to have them. 
any personal use cases, things that you might be able to share to kind of add to the body of knowledge um, would, is really interesting. And uh, as I mentioned, we will be sending you a link out to both um, the final slides along with some of the questions and answers that we've discussed along with the recorded version, and the slide deck also has a, a, you know, all the original links, sources, and a number of articles and the, the publications that we have found for those of you who are interested in taking a little uh, deeper dive into the technology. And so with that, um, thank you for joining me here today, and I look forward to your feedback and follow-up, and we'll be in contact with you with the uh, links to the slides and presentation. Thank you so much. Bye.